Yeah. Take it away. Okay, so um, if anybody wants to keep an eye out, 3.30 is my target for our next stretch and pee break. Um, I haven't yet a reference to this handout, which as you'll notice, probably gonna be how it works for the rest of the time, but I every now and then I like to sort of run through to make sure that the basic points have been covered. Um, so uh, first slide says um, name, title, and email, and phone number. So those are my email and phone number. So if you would like to reach out, that's a good day. Um, generally, I answer texts reasonably well. Sometimes I answer my phone, sometimes I don't. <clears throat> um, so addressing limiting factors is a general principle and objective. We're trying to address limiting factors. We're not trying to control everything. We're just trying to make sure that life has access to what it needs. Um, life will do the best. She can with what she's got, is a sort of the philosophy. Um, and minerals, biology, carbon, water, and air, those are the five points we talked about. Um, supporting and empowering soil life is a key to healthy plants, I made that point. Things that you do or that be done that harm soil life, harm your plants, like letting the soil dry out, the soil's too tight, things like that. Um, I would say you're well responsible for maintaining an environment where these dynamics are operational. And so um, if you want to be you know, responsible for the genocide of a few hundred billion organisms. Take the tiller out for a spin, you know. Um, think of it that way. You are the caretaker, you are responsible for that ecosystem, and so anything that is done there that causes death to happen is your fault. Um, it's one way to look at it, um, if you need such inspiration. Um, some people, different people are inspired in different ways. Um, so, what's that? Catholic, Catholic guilt, exactly, right. <laughs> I mean, we've <laughs> infrastructures have been developed over time to control people and manipulate them. And so uh, some people are, are inspired by like inspiration and some are inspired by fear, uh, pain, you know, like pleasure. There's all kinds of different inspirations and different people work different ways. So I try to throw out a few different ones to see, you know, <clears throat> whatever resonates for you. We're all different. So um, quality is the objective. I think I made that point. Um, the quality of the food is the objective, not the claim, not the label, not the marketing, but the actual nutritional value, which we think connects to flavor, aroma, shelf life, soil health, farm viability, ecosystem function, human health, um, and as I hope to be able to get to by the end of tomorrow, consciousness. Um, I believe that, <clears throat> this, here's the next slide, these connections, soil health, plant health, human health, cultural, environmental health, these are all effectively symbiotic, they're all parts of this, this whole greater one thing. Um, topics for today, soil testing and mineral balancing is our next topic. Um, cover cropping and mulching, I think we've touched on that, I've got a slide on it. Um, inoculation um, for starting seeds, potting soil, um, tillage, fertigation, irrigation, foliar spring. Those are the topics we've got through the rest of this, this handout, um, which I think we probably should be able to complete by the end of the day today. So. Um, the next topic is, is minerals. Um, so moving on to page two, slide number seven. Um, you can see those slide numbers at the bottom right hand corner of each slide, they're quite small, but um, top of page two. Yes. And just at that age where I'm starting to find that like, the, my eyes aren't quite as good as they used to be. Um, but I think I can, I can still read the seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 there. Um, all right, so <clears throat> I promised you before lunch, we talk about minerals. Um, during this section, and it's a big topic. Um, and actually, you can see there's probably three or four pages of slides here on that topic of minerals. Um, I don't know that I want to um, go into this in quite as much depth as I sometimes do, because we don't have a we don't have this the full window um, today. But but um, and we don't have any soil tests. Sometimes when I do this course, I ask people to get a soil test and bring it, and then we can learn how to read a soil test. Um, and my objective is to you know, leave you with the skills so that you don't need to trust someone else to read your soil test and make your, own, make your recommendations. Ideally, I like people to be in a place where if you're gonna be engaging in the soil testing and the mineral recommendation protocol, um, you have those skills yourself. It's great to have agronomists, it's great, it's great to have people that are consultants that can, can support you, but it's also really good to um, I think have the basic knowledge base um, of your own. It's your land, not the consultant's land. And sometimes the consultant has an incentive to sell you stuff. Um, and so we want to be really taking as much power as we can um, for the, that responsibility for our land's decisions. Um, 
So in that framework, I say a base plus or agridine do two test, which is a strong acid test. Um, there's a whole conversation here, which has to do with the types of soil tests you take. Um, people may or may not be aware of the fact that there are all different kinds of soil tests um, and they are not calibrated to each other and they are coming from different philosophical perspectives. Um, I like to think of a, you know, if you want to go to a radiologist, they'll take a certain set of tests and recommend radiation. Um, if you're going to go to a naturopath, they'll take a certain set of tests and recommend, you know, nutrition. If you're going to go to a homeopath, they may take certain types of tests and recommend homeopathy. So depending on the lens of the person who's making the recommendations, they'll have a certain set of assessments, um, which then guide their recommendations. So this Agridine Do 2 test um, comes from a background of a guy named Dr. William Albrecht, um, who I'd like to, again, hide behind. Um, he was the chair of the uh, soil department at the University of Missouri for about 20 years. So, you know, Langer University, chair of the soil department, that's kind of considered to be legitimate in the Western scientific world and the Langer University community. Um, he, uh, Albrecht was a, uh, grew up on a farm in Illinois, he was a farm boy. Um, and uh, was, you know, relatively intelligent, went to school, um, got his degree, got his master's, went on, got his PhD, um, and actually did his, uh, his grad research looking at uh, the connection between, um, I think it was, it was World War I draft records and United States soil types. So here's an interesting, interesting overlay for you. Um, when boys were drafted for World War I, uh, the way they were determined to be fit to sit in the um, trenches and get gassed was whether they had strong teeth and good arches on their feet, um, which was effectively the way they were determined to be fit for the Civil War was, can you march 20 miles and eat hardtack? If you can't march 20 miles, you got flat feet, then you're not worth the hassle of getting shot. If you can't eat hardtack, then we can't keep you fed, so we don't want you around. And so, that was basically the metric that was used to determine whether somebody was fit for, um, for military service was physiological development, which similar, this is very similar to horses, if anybody's familiar with horses. Um, you wanna see, you know, if a horse is a good horse, you look at their feet, you look at their teeth, you know. Um, so that was how they were determining whether people were, were fit for military service in World War I. Um, and what Albrecht was looking at, which is very interesting, was that the boys who were raised in the High Plains, um, the breadbasket, the sort of the, um, you know, the, the upper Midwest and areas like this uh, were accepted for the draft at much higher levels than the boys that were raised in Appalachia. Um, and it didn't have anything to do with their genetic heritage because there were those of German descent in both areas, those of Italian descent in both areas. So it didn't have to do with their DNA. It had to do with their epigenetics. It had to do with the environmental conditions that they were raised in. Um, so functionally, um, I mean, people familiar with epigenetics is a concept that basically says, you know, you've got your genes and then you've got the environment and the environment affects your genetic expression. So what they were seeing, what was being documented was that boys who grew up in Appalachia generally had flatter feet and poorer teeth and boys that grew up in the, in the sort of the plain states had better arches and better teeth. And um, Albrecht said, that, well, that's very interesting. Um, this was back before you know, a lot of food was shipped, right, long distances. People generally ate food that was grown in their bioregion. And so, so Albrecht's hypothesis was that the, the nutritional nature of their food in this area was superior to the nutritional nature of the food in that area. Um, and so he went on to do, I think, over 500 um, studies, peer-reviewed published studies, sort of teasing this out and looking at, um, as an agronomist, as a as a, you know, a, a, a <clears throat> someone in the, in the soil department, um, these connections. And so he would take soil, um, take, take clay, and he would put it through a centrifuge and spin out, remember all the cations I was talking about, the calcium and the potassium and the magnesium, he'd sort of get all that spun out so it was just the pure clay. And then he would add, you know, 50% um, calcium, 30% um, magnesium, 10% potassium, 10% sodium into this soil, and 70% calcium, 10% magnesium, 10% potassium, whatever, in this soil. He would basically make soils that had different levels and ratios of minerals in them, 
and then grow crops out in those soils and then feed those crops to rabbits or to chickens or to rats or whatever and have those and watch those animals over a couple generations and see what happened. Could he replicate what he was seeing in the draft records on animals by love modulating the nutrients, the, the actual elements in the soil that the food was grown in. And he absolutely was able to do that. Um, these rabbits <clears throat> had large litters. Um, you know, they were friendly, they cuddled, they didn't get disease. These ones over here were small, they had small litters, they, they fought with each other, they killed each other, they died early. He was able to get all these, you know, physiological variations, which is not just the body size and health, but also like aggressiveness versus friendliness, get all these sort of emotional, psychological kind of dynamics to shift in the animals based on what was in the soil that their food was grown in. Does that make sense? Really, really, really interesting stuff. Dr. William Albrecht, um, it was between 1930, early 30s and early 50s when he was, uh, when he ran the soil department at the University of Missouri. Um, and, uh, you know, during that time, had a number of students that he taught, um, you know, PhD students that came on, and they ended up working at other universities, land grant universities. Um, and there was this really, really interesting and amazing work being done um, in the land grant university system during that time. Um, and uh, and what happened after World War II was uh, that the the armaments industry. Um, that, uh, so the, you know, the companies that were building <clears throat> explosives and chemical weapons and things like that, um, after World War II, you know, they had all these factories that were able to build all this, these, these things, and they didn't have a market anymore. There was no market for explosives or chemical weapons. Um, and so um, they looked for a different market. Um, anybody, you guys, most people remember the um, Oklahoma City bombing? Remember 1996, 1995, whenever that was? Oklahoma City bombing, yeah. Timothy McVeigh. What was that? Remember what the bomb was made out of? <coughs> Fertilizer. <coughs> Ammonium sulfate, triple superphosphate. Like, yep. Anybody know how that, how, that, how that worked? Like, <laughs> like, why, why are those things fertilizer? Because those are the ingredients in explosives. The companies that were making explosives said, we've got the factories that can make these ingredients and no market for that. They said, what can we do? What's an alternate market for these ingredients? And they said, farmers. I mean, um, nerve gas. Have you ever heard about nerve gas? Yeah. You've heard about uh, insecticides? And hydrous ammonia. Yeah. So insecticides and nerve gas are the exact same thing, just with a different label, yeah. right? It can kill humans, it can kill insects too. We just, we just called it an insecticide. Change the, like, <laughs> yes, it does technically kill insects. So that now we've got this factory that can make nerve gas. We're like, what do we do with, the, with the, all the nerve gas production? We sell it to farmers. So interestingly, industry went out and they basically gave money to universities and said, will you do an experiment which tests to see whether the yields go up when you add this soluble nitrogen material onto the soil. And they're like, oh, look, it does. And hey, we'll give you a million dollars and endow a building and, you know, and, and, you know, three professors. And if you fire Albrecht and teach this stuff. And so that's what went down. And we call conventional ag now, if you look at the history of where the data came from and who was behind it, I mean, this is actually where it came from. So <clears throat> I was brought up um, as a good, you know, organic farming sort of countercultural community child to not trust universities, to think companies are bad, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think it's companies per se or universities per se, because there are actually a bunch of really wonderful people in universities, in my experience, and some pretty good people in companies too. Um, but it's more about this question of incentive and and you know what's the what's the agenda behind the scenes? And I don't I think a lot of people who are in the you know in the um, uh, extension service right now don't actually know the history of where the things that they're recommending came from and where and what the actual science is behind it. Um, so yeah, you I mean you've got these now we jack up our plants with lots of nitrogen. They grow big and they get insects, and so we offer them. Hey, you know, to the farmers, will you? 
experiment with this thing and see if it kills insects. Oh my God, it does, it kills insects. So they publish that report, they teach all the kids to use that material, and boom, off we go. And we've got this thing, which we now call conventional lag, which really is only about 70 years old. Um, so anyway, I tell that whole story as context to say that the lab strategy, the testing strategy that you that is used at land grant universities now in a broad measure um, is one which is designed to assess the levels of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus that you need based on this concept of soluble nutrients and, and plants with lots of volume with low nutrients, et cetera. So um, if you take your soil and you send it to Montana State and get a report back, what I'm about to teach you is not relevant because it's the wrong kind of test. What I'm gonna teach you how to do is to work from an Albrecht style test. So if you engage with a dominant paradigm agronomic you know, mode of assessment, like that is designed to recommend NPK fertilizer. Albrecht's science was designed to balance what was called base saturation for these levels of calcium and potassium and magnesium and things like that, which creates a dynamic where the plants are you know, pest and disease resistant and the animals that eat those plants are vigorous and healthy. So you have to look at the science behind the structure of analysis. Does that all make sense? I think I, I think I've made the point. People are basically getting me here. So yeah. it's just called an Albrecht, Albrecht test. Broadly, it's called Albrecht. Um, but, you know, there's a series of labs that generally use that. Um, Did you want a report? What's that? Did you want a report? Um, um, I generally use the Logan, I'm not sure who's that from, a and so, Midwest? Yeah, so Midwest is a, is a good lab. Um, um, uh, a and generally uh, operates from the Albrecht style. Um, um, Logan is the one that, that our, if you go to our website organizationally, you can download their, their form. Um, Do you know Kinsey? Kinsey is also an Albrecht. Okay. Yeah, Kinsey actually worked with, with Albrecht. Okay. Um, he was actually one of Albrecht's direct students. Uh, Neil Kinsey, absolutely. Um, so um, anyway, this is just a, 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 a framework, <clears throat> uh, which I think is important. So that all being said, um, what I've got written here are target levels of macro and trace elements from that perspective, these first two slides on page two. Um, so sulfur, parts per million, phosphorus, 75, calcium, magnesium, and potassium, those are in percents for base saturation. Um, so let's explain what base saturation is here quickly. Um, I think the metaphor of the, um, <clears throat> well, I, I, I had the, I had the, the, the clay, oops, um, I had the clay sort of yeah. particles here. So you have these bonding sites, these little, basically these negative charges that are sticking out and attaching to that will be your calcium or your potassium or your magnesium, et cetera. Um, so base saturation says, if you've got a hundred of these bonding sites, how much, how many of them are connected to calcium? How many of them are connected to potassium? How many of them are connected to sodium, et cetera? And so um, what Albrecht figured out was there was this sort of magical ratio. Um, and I got, what is it, 68? Did I just give the numbers? Or 60 to 75, 12 to 8, so 68, 15, three or whatever. Um, I got ranges there because in a sandy soil, you want it to be a little bit different than if you're in a clayey soil, right? Um, so. That's probably going a little bit too fast. Um, the ratios are here, the broad ranges are here uh, for, for base saturation. Um, I'll just do calcium and magnesium, because that's the key point. Um, if you're in a clay soil, you want more calcium. If you're in a sand soil, you want more magnesium. I talked about that before with the, with the clay soil and the, and the gypsum. I said the, mag the calcium is the biggest the biggest, like by size, it's just a bigger atom than magnesium is. And so if you want your soil to loosen up because it's too tight, then you wanna have your calcium levels higher. If you're in a sandy soil, which is too loose and the water runs through it too fast, you want it to tighten up, then you're gonna to wanna to have your magnesium levels be a little bit higher. So these are all sort of ballpark ranges. Um, and certainly organic matter and life is a really important piece of this puzzle, <clears throat> but 
understanding this mineral component, I think is also, also important. Um, but boron, I've got three parts per million. Um, and so I said, you know, boron is probably a limiting factor, a deficient nutrient in basically everybody's soil. Who was it that asked? Did you ask, can I just do it? Somebody over here asked, can I just add this boron. without testing? Um, boron. Well, we'll talk about the specific forms of boron in a minute. Somebody over here said, do I have to take a soil test or can I just add stuff? Like that was you, yeah, exactly. Um, so boron is one where probably I can answer you, yes. Um, um, but yes, what? Yes, you have to take soil. Yes, you can use it. Okay. Basically, everybody needs okay. it without worrying about taking a taking a test. Um, generally, it's good to have some context. Um, ideally, you know, you've got a, a a web of discernment, and you maybe have five or ten people in a bioregion who are all taking soil tests, and you can see what's the pattern across the board. And once you've tested that out, and I'm sorry, I just don't have the knowledge base for this area to be able to speak with confidence. Awesome. What's that? <clears throat> What I would like is 10 from across the state. And then if I can look at them all together, I can say across the board, all you guys could do this. I'm pretty safe making that recommendation. Um, so <clears throat> I wanna move through this fairly rapidly because I've got a bunch of other things to do here. Um, um, so just these are the broad, broad, broad statements uh, about um, target levels. So we've got the macro elements on the, on the first slide there, the trace elements on the second slide. Um, I think I talked about molybdenum earlier, um, cobalt I talked about, people are probably familiar with manganese and copper and zinc. Um, conversion rates, so my objective here is to get you to a point where you can take a soil test and, um, well, let's, sure, let's give you, let's just take, give me some numbers from your soil test. What's your boron level? That's actually pretty good. I mean, where I come from, it's like 0.1 to 0.3 is where people's average soil levels are. Boron is very low in most soils. So yeah, it's almost, I haven't found anywhere in the country yeah. where boron is at sufficient levels. California, and so that's like the one element that I can pretty much, oh, molybdenum probably is another one, where I can pretty much guarantee everybody needs boron. Why is that? Like, what happened that there's no... It's an anion, which means it leaches. Oh, okay. So the cations will, will, be, will be attached to the soil colloid right. and anions will leach out. It's whether they've got a positive charge or a negative charge mm -hmm. from a chemistry perspective. Is that just because we planted annuals and we're not cycling nutrients? Because the organic matter that was here historically has been okay. worn out right. and the organic matter holds the anions. But when the organic matter is gone, then, they, then the anions okay. leach. So I have- There's all kinds of reasons that the, yeah. I have a, my report. Yes. Easy. My boron is at 3.12. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing that's probably. Have you been working with Kinsey for a while? Um, this was, I have not been making amendments no. based on it, but okay. doing the tests. Well, with the I, idea that I was going to someday. What type of soil? To the point of you should take a soil test first. Yeah. Yeah. Garden. Oh. Uh, pasture field. We'll work with yours. It was 1.1, you yeah. said, yeah. on your boron level? Okay, so we're just going to put that to the side. 1.1 ppm. I'm assuming it's in ppm. Yeah. All right. So um, we're going to get to that in a minute. This, this slide 10 talks about what a ppm is. Um, so slide 9 says conversions. So for anybody who is working on like a backyard garden scale, um, if we come up at the end of this process with a recommendation that says 500 pounds per acre, quick math says that equals 11 pounds per thousand square feet. So if you, you know, there's gonna be some math in this section of the course. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I don't wanna tell you that because some people just like, they immediately start glazing over. This isn't math, this is minerals. <laughs> um, yeah, which is why we defer to somebody who knows better to give up recommendations, but then they're coming from this industrial perspective and then we don't understand that they were, we're getting recommendations that are actually going to destroy our soil. So yeah, it's not high math. It's mostly pretty basic math. Like I've got a third grader and I think almost everything I'm recommending to you is like what he learns in third grade. So like the, like the level of work you need to do is, well, there is one algebraic equation, but it's, yeah. Um, Okay, so that's it. 50 pounds per acre equals that, 500 pounds equals this. Um, the next one is math for minerals. So um, generally when you get a soil report, it comes to you um, written as PPM. 
So 50 ppm or 5 ppm or whatever, um, ppm means parts per million. Um, and generally when we apply minerals, we apply them in pounds per acre. So you put 100 pounds per acre of this down or you put five pounds per acre of this down. So this is really the only, the highest math here in this whole process is to be able to convert from parts per million to pounds per acre. That's really the secret that the agronomists have is they know how to convert from parts per million to pounds per acre. And once you know how to do that, basically everything else is doable. And it's excitingly really easy to convert from parts per million to pounds per acre. It's written down here in the slide. Um, there's an assumption here. There's always assumptions when it comes to doing things in a Western rational linear manner. So let's just identify what the assumptions are. Um, and that is when we're taking a soil test and we're talking about the, 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 you know, how much soil we're measuring, you could say, look, there's soil that starts here and it goes down, you know, to the center of the earth or the crust is 12 miles thick. Um, so there's a bunch of minerals in that area. Elaine Ingham will say, we have all the minerals we need. We don't need to add any minerals. And if you push her, she'll say in the top 24 feet. Um, and then you ask the question, well, how many plants that you're growing have 24 foot deep root, roots? Um, she say, well, they should. And I'll totally grant you that point. In a proper polyculture environment with trees and everything else, you should have 24 foot deep root systems that are able to pull, pull things up from way down deep. But in many cases, you're growing an annual that has maybe a three inch deep root system, right? It, there's, there's soil compaction at three inches. And so the, the wheat roots go down and then they go over. Or the corn roots go down and then they go over. And so they're not accessing at six inches deep. So it doesn't really matter what's at 24 feet deep. So- That's like, I've heard that same thing before. Like, if you take the test, it's like total nutrients mm -hmm. coming in or something. Yes. It's just that if you have the biology, then that converts it to plants available. So you're saying that's not necessarily the case. And the caveat is if you have the biology. Right. Right. So. And what, what she's saying, Elaine says, which is I pushed her on this because I've talked to a lot of these people and I've like, she came to our conference and was like, you don't need minerals. I'm like, all right, Elaine, you're going to say that at my conference? I'm going to call you out. Okay. So I, I, you know, we had this conversation in public and I said, you know, how about somebody who's got a sand dune, right? In Michigan, there's a lot of farms that are basically growing on sand dunes and you can do a total nutrient analysis okay. and there's not any boron in that top, okay. you know, and she says, well, in the top 24 feet. I'm like, okay, Elaine, so you don't need minerals, comma, because all the minerals you need generally across the planet are present in the top 24 feet is a true statement but you didn't put that second half of the sentence okay. in there. So if you had a polyculture, et cetera, et cetera, yes, you shouldn't need to add anything. But in many cases, that top, the root zone that is where your crops are growing, depending on what's happened historically, does not have some of these things there. So, so when, it's, a, it's a big complicated conversation. Yeah. So when I was shown how to do, with the extension, how to do soil testing, yeah. he showed me how to drive down and, and he told me to drive down like between 12 and 18 inches, mm -hmm. um, which is in my soil really different from what's on the top. Yep. Um, should I be not digging that deep then, at least initially, or? Um... So <clears throat> if you're growing an annual crop and you, so, so that one of the things they use is called a penetrometer, right? Mm -hmm. right? So the penetrometer is something you can, you can stand on and you can look at, it's got a little gauge. It says how many pounds per square inch of pressure is required to go down from inch one to inch two, from inch two to inch three. And you stand on it and you're like, oh, at inch six, I need 500 PSI to move down. And 500 PSI, if anybody's ever <laughs> had like a compressor, with 100 PSI and sprayed their finger with 100 PSI of air, you're like, that's a lot of pressure. So 500 PSI is a ton of pressure. And the reality is that plant roots aren't really digging through 500 PSI. Um, so, so we're testing, we should be testing the top. So the assumption here is the top six inches. That's the assumption, which is an assumption. And everything is, a, so we have to say, it depends, everything's dependent on context. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you've got an 18 inch aerobic zone. Ideally, you, your, <clears throat> your water table is moving up and down from 10 feet 
every day, and there is no, there is no subsoil compaction. That's ideally, but in many cases, based on historical context, we do have this plow pan at six inches or at four inches or at eight inches, which is extremely tight. And functionally, whatever's below that is unavailable. Ideally, you were to engage in management practices to crack that open so that your roots are going down deeply. You're gonna have polycultures of cover crops that are reaching down deeply and pulling things up. So over time, you, do, you shouldn't need to add much at all, but over time and now are two different things. You know, I'm a farmer, I wanna get a crop this year. It's great that in five years, through good management practices, I'm gonna have good structure, but if I don't have any yield for the next three years, I'm gonna be out of business, so it doesn't matter. So there's, it's, everything is context and there's all these different dynamics at play. I just wanna to try to open it up, frame it. Um, so the assumption here is that there's two million pounds of soil in the top six inches of an acre. So the basic recipe is um, parts per million times two equals pounds per acre. <clears throat> so if it says 1.1 parts per million of boron are present in the soil, that means the actual amount of boron present in the soil is 2.2. Okay, so if we, so we, and then, and then if you look up at, at slide eight, and it says the target level of boron, see that? Slide eight is three parts per million. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is two pounds per acre. So, so if the target is three parts per million, which is six per times two equals six pounds per acre. And we've got 1.1 parts per million times two equals 2.2 pounds per acre. We can do high math. We subtract 2.2 from six and we get 3.8 pounds per acre of boron needed. And we got that, high math. Multiplication, subtraction. It's really, really not that complicated to get some context, just some basic context of your soil where it stands. So you've got a third of what you need, roughly. Um, and so you can do that for all these minerals. Doesn't matter what, you know, you get your salt test back, you get your, your copper level, you get your zinc level, you get your cobalt level, you get your sulfur level, you get your phosphorus level. <clears throat> the report will come back in parts per million your target level is here in pounds, and then you just do the math, and you can see <laughs> roughly, and the one thing you can do is what the quantities are of deficiency, and then the other thing is what the ratio is of deficiency. So we have a third as much of the boron we need, you may have a tenth as much of the molybdenum you need. <clears throat> and so you might wanna say, well, the molybdenum is way low from a percent standpoint, let's, and I've only got 50 to $50 per acre to spend um, on fertility, I'm going to focus on molybdenum this year, not boron. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm talking. Does all make sense? Yeah. Okay. There's a recording being made, so if you're like, go home and you're like, oh, I forgot exactly what you're saying. I guess there's going to be a recording. So, um, all right. So that's basically what I just did on the sulfur, for example, slide. Right. Pounds per acre times two equals, um, sorry, parts per million times two equals, equals pounds per acre. Um, so then the next thing you do is you figure out, so we, I used gypsum as an example earlier. I said calcium, you know, gypsum is a source of calcium deficiency, progressed cal calcium deficiencies. Um, you guys don't have technically calcium deficiencies here, so your soil report might say you got plenty of calcium. So today we're talking about the reports, tomorrow we're gonna talk about the plant report, as in when the plant shows the symptom of a calcium deficiency, well, it doesn't matter if it's in the soil, what matters is if it's not available to the plant. And then we need to figure out what the dynamics are to do to address that systemically. Um, if it's not present in the soil, you need to address it, is my point. Once it's present in the soil, you need to make sure it gets into the plant. That's the second step. Um, yes? This is kind of on topic but kind of a weird question so i have a midwest report mm -hmm. and the boron on here says 1.3 for one location yeah but then they do a high medium low very high kind mm -hmm. of yes. letter on it and this says 1.3 is high 
It okay. says 0.8 at the other location was medium. Medium as far as what's normal or medium as far as what's That's what good? What I'm wondering is what, because if three is good, they're saying 1.3 is high. I wonder what their Midwest bases are so, on then. Comparing it to what here we go to another. <laughs> <laughs> is this high for what we'll have or high for not what um, plant want? So if you go to UVM, for instance, University of Vermont, and, and they will report boron, um, and you get a report back that says I have 0.3 ppm boron, they'll, it says between 0.1 and 1 is normal for New England soils. For New England soils, not for what the plant wants. There's the caveat. So, when they're so what's they're normal different. and what's optimal are two different things. So who the hell am I to say this is what's optimal is what the question is you should be asking. <laughs> I, it's written down, so therefore we're just going to trust it. Isn't that the thing we've been trained to do? Mm -hmm. Right? It's, it's great. And there it is. We're not questioning where I got this from. So that's what you should be doing. Um, so. And asking them what they're basing there. So these are all, it's a series of things. And, and if, I, mean, I don't like to spend much time in this, in this logical number reality, but it is part of what farmers deal with and oftentimes feel a little bit overwhelmed by. So hopefully this is exposing these questions. Um, I will say that these target levels that I have printed here came from my asking these questions to people who I thought knew better. Um, I grew up, I think I made mention of 2005, 2006, 2007, was about when I was starting to try to you know, figure these things out. And the place where I went and got, like found like there was a bunch of answers was a place called Acres USA. And anybody's heard of that? Acres USA is a, they have an, had an annual conference for 50 years. They've had a journal. Um, Charles Walters was the founder, um, unfortunately passed about maybe even just 10 years ago. I'm not quite sure how long ago, um, but um, <clears throat> you know, Albrecht's work would have effectively been lost to history if Charles Walters had not found him and said, you know, this is amazing. Let me sort of make you famous. And he took his work and he published it in books and he, you know, uh, Carrie Reams, if anyone's ever heard of Carrie Reams, another person who his work would have been totally lost to history with the refractometer and conductivity meters. Like, um, and Charles Walters said, you're amazing, this is important work, it needs to be shared. Um, and so there were a bunch of people who learned from them and their work and wrote books. So if you've heard of uh, Kinsey and um, uh, Jerry Brunetti, Gary Zimmer, Arden Anderson, Bruce Tanio, um, anybody's heard any of these names? Um, these are all people who basically learned at Acres before I did in the 70s or 80s from these people who had done this work and started working as agronomists with farmers across the country on scale. Um, and so when I went to Acres and I said, this is all blowing my mind, oh my God, um, what's going on here? And I said, you know, where's the organization that's sharing this information. We've got the permaculturalists, they've got their groups, we've got the organic people, they've got their groups, we've got the you know, biodynamic people, they've got their groups, we've got the, the, the IPMers, we've got the agroecologists. Like, who's talking about these biological principles? Where is the educational organization where this content is being shared openly? And they were like, there isn't one. It was all being taught by consultants. So if you were a farmer who could afford a consultant, they could come to your farm and use their decades of experience and say, okay, you need this, 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 this. And in many cases, the farmers are getting really, really exciting results. And so that's what was happening at Acres was people were, like the people who were doing it and getting those results were coming together and talking about all this exciting stuff. And there was all kinds of things at Acres about you know, the quantum and the structuring of water and the energetics and the intention. This is not just chemistry. Which is part of what's the whole name of Acres? Acres USA. Okay. This is well, so this is 10, 15 years ago when Charles Walters was still alive. So Charles died, his son, it was handed over to his son, who basically sold the company. And now it's it's much less of a cutting edge organization, I would say. Still very, very good information, but I mean I've recently talked to the publisher and they're like, you know, uh, we were talking there was some crazy stuff back in the 70s and 80s. We're like trying to disassociate with that. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> Make a new these, things, these things evolve over time. So um, long story, the point is, I had these questions because Gary Zimmer was giving one set of target numbers. 
Arden Anderson was giving a different set of target numbers. Jerry Brunetti was giving a different set of target numbers. I'm like, guys, there's a certain bunch of us here who really respect you. It would be helpful if you could get your story straight. <laughs> um, and so I literally went from one to the next to the next. I went to Arden and I said, okay, Arden, give me your numbers, I'm gonna write them down. And I went to Jerry and I said, Jerry, give me your numbers, I'm gonna write them down. And this is what Arden says. And what do you think? Can we find a common ground here? And I went to Gary and I said, Gary, give me your numbers and let's write them down. Um, at John, we all know John Kemp, he and I were basically at the same time coming into Acres at the same year. Like we were both in this process and studying and trying to figure this out together. Um, so, yeah, this is basically what we came up with, and so I've been using it ever since. Um, and again, it is a one-size-fits-all, which is, of course, then not right, right, because different soils have different dynamics. So this is a spot to aim at. Um, and the real answer, as a lot of people will tell you, is what's the plant telling you? Like, what's the result on the land of the actual thing? So I think you can feel fairly comfortable that if these numbers are present in a soil test, you have sufficient levels of these nutrients in the environment and you don't need to worry about it. And so that was a long answer, but I think I covered a few different points there. Yes. Um, I have probably two questions and I'll make it to the bottom because that is what you, you kind of blow up on. Um, this 3 PPL, mm -hmm. I'm saying in conventional chemistry. Yes. The universe chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I really don't understand much about the average sure. mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into those details. Fine. The difference of, we can do it over a break. Yeah, yeah. that's what it is. But in your, this 3 ppm, is that based on the soils out in the east, what you saw, or in the Midwest? This is part of the problem, is yeah. that Neil Kinsey was working in Nebraska, and, Ger and Jerry Renetti was working in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and Gary Zimmer's working in Wisconsin, and so we've got different foundational dynamics going on, um, you know, and there's this thing called rain, right? So we've got a ton of it out east, and you guys don't have much of it here. So, again, this is a one-size-fits-all, which is foundationally a flawed thing. Okay, no, so, let's not get into yeah. the the second question is, what about toxicity, oral toxicity? Because vegetables especially are very, there is a sensitivity in mm -hmm. the amount of boron in the soil that could easily result in toxicity. Do you have any, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So I was, I've got a few things to go into, and that was one of the, <laughs> coming down the pipe here is, when we're adding trace elements specifically, um, they are not naturally occurring. Like pure boron does not naturally occur. Pure manganese does not naturally occur. Pure copper does not naturally occur. Um, from an organic perspective, which is the one I come from, um, you know, one of the things is you don't use unnatural things, except we've got these little carve outs, which is we understand that boron is really, really important. And so we're allowed to use soluble, which is not naturally occurring. If a soil test says you need it, we're allowed to use copper sulfate, which is not naturally occurring if a soil test says we need it, because we understand the critical role of copper. So um, I'm gonna be talking about these things as though we're talking about adding specifically boron or adding specifically copper or adding specifically manganese. And we're gonna get into this all this complicated math. And at the end of it, I'm gonna tell you, rock dust and sea salt. I'm gonna say, don't buy these processed products with this just one thing here or one thing there. What does nature do? what are the materials that nature uses to address these deficiencies? So different people come at it from different contexts. Different, some people wanna add fertilizer. They wanna they want do their math, they're like really linear, that makes them really comfortable, they feel safe. I can do the math here, I'm gonna add this one pound of this in this format, and that's really cool. And great. If you're adding boron and you didn't have boron before, and that's gonna make your plants healthier, and the crops are gonna be more nutritious, and you're gonna have better pest resistance, that's forward motion, right? Addressing the forward deficiency in that fashion is forward motion. Um, what does nature do? Nature uses these naturally occurring materials which have very broad spectrums of things which are not in a soluble format, so you don't have these logistical issues. So. Um, is that somewhere in your, in your 
Um, the last slide of the second day is rock dust and seawater. Um, so like after it's all said and done, if you're gonna bring anything in from anywhere, because basically you don't need to bring anything in from anywhere because basically you've got everything you need right there. It's just about how you do it. If you're ever gonna bring anything in from anywhere because we have abused our lands, those are the two things. And it's not just for the North American context. It's for the global context because most of us North Americans are pretty damn privileged. And we've got resources, we've got capacity. You know, we are really struggling. And, you know, it may be desertifying somewhat here, but it's not desertifying like it is in lots of other parts of the world, anywhere near as much. So they have a worse ecological context and less money. And so for me, how do we work with land? How do we systemically address imbalances? If we've got to have a strategy that's applicable for all people in all places. And so working with nature's naturally occurring materials, I think is a foundational piece of the puzzle. We have denuded land through the practice of agriculture over thousands of years, right? Nature has ways of rebalancing mineral deficiencies. There's this thing called glaciation. Anybody heard of glaciation, right? Every few thousand years, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, things get imbalanced. The climate goes out of whack. There's a bunch of snow, it turns into glaciers. They come through, they grind up the mountains. All that, all that parent material gets ground up and then washed out and blown out. And we have like a remineralization of event. When Mount St. Helens blew off in 1980, right? There was 12 inches of ash and it was like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Ag culture is gonna be horrible. And then actually things grew amazingly well because they, it was a remineralization event after the big tsunami in um, wherever it was in Thailand in 2005, whenever that happened. Remember that one? Yes. All the seawater got spread on the landscape. And they're like, oh my God, we're not gonna be able to grow crops here forever. And then plants were like, whoa! <laughs> because there's 90 different elements in seawater. Okay, so we're sure so, on seawater here in Montana. <laughs> so, sea salt, White Himalayan sea salt? That is expensive, well, yeah. but the stuff from Kansas is not. So the whole center What's of this- Kansas? Kansas, Kansas gray salt. Kansas gray salt. Oh, gray salt. Isn't that sodium? Isn't so, that so the center of this continent used to be an ocean. People know this one? Some, I don't know, 50 million years ago. I don't know what it was. Was um, Was it 60, 50? I'm not sure. 200, I don't, I don't know actually do you, when it was. The center of this continent used to be an ocean and then it dried up or somebody raised up and they all drained out or whatever it happened. But there's these salt beds that are part of the geological like profile and you can dig them out. And this was back before there was radiation and, right. you know, like we heard of like C90, you heard of C90, right? Anyone heard of C90? It's a, it's a salt that comes out of the Baja, California. Well, Fukushima happened um, 2011. Like the Pacific is full of radiation, not too much, but enough. There's microplastics. You know, people are concerned about toxins in the environment. Um, so there's things you've heard of like azomite or like C90 or like Himalayan salt that are marketed products, right? Azomite is a beautiful, amazing rock dust. Where I live in Massachusetts, it costs 40 bucks per 40 pound bag. Um, there's also this thing called, you know, roads we have in Massachusetts and those roads are made out of rock and that rock comes from the hole in the ground, which is not too far away because it's really inexpensive. It's expensive to haul rock too far. So we have a quarries. It's a quarry, right? Right. Right there. So what you do when you get the quarry is you dig a hole, you you know, you know drill it, you put the explosives in there, blow, blow it up. You take the crusher, the, 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 big, the digger comes and picks up all the chunks, they carry it, they dump it into the crusher, it gets crushed. There's like these, you know, these screens, there's a half inch screen and a quarter inch screen. And there's a waste product, the crusher dust, the float, the waste product, which they dump back in the hole, right? So that happens. Like a pile. Or a pile. To be left to go, to go back in the hole <laughs> or whatever, which we can get in Massachusetts for about two bucks a ton. So I can buy my azomite for 40 bucks for 40 pound bag, or I can buy my locally, my waste product, crusher dust, basalt, got 45 elements in it, rock does for two bucks a ton. So you do the math, so you can get 20 ask, tons for 40 bucks. If it's like your local rock dust. Yeah. I guess in my mind, I looked at the local rock dust as like, my soil already has what it probably has and I don't want the local, I want 
something more <laughs> exotic. <laughs> Grass is always greener. Yeah, but that, 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 that doesn't matter. Well, I mean, so it's how far great. down the rabbit hole do you want to get in this? Yeah. So, so generally, okay, so there's a, okay. I'm jumping all over, but you guys are following me and not minding too much. I don't see too many people getting pissed, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, yeah, um, so your soil out here has been exposed to weathering for how many years? A few, probably, right? Thousands, we'll safely say thousands. So some of those things like boron and molybdenum have been leached out. The parent material might have had them, and that's over here, it's just the parent material. So if you're, if somebody's already digging it up and crushing it and basically saying this is trash and you're like, ah, oh, you know, one man's wealth is what trash another man's wealth or whatever that, whatever that line is. Treasure, treasure. 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 Yeah. Um, what you really could do is you could assess that rock dust. You could test it. And so we have different, different types of rock that are different, you know, in different spots, you've got different parent materials. So strategically, this is one of the things we started to try to do like 10 years ago in the organization was do this rock dust testing project where we would ask people as a collective, you know, find, you know, 10 quarries in your bioregion. Like actually what you should do is you go to the local university, the geology department, and you say, let's look at the geological makeup of the landscape. <clears throat> let's see what different kinds of rock are in the bioregion. And then we can overlay that on the map of where the quarries are, because in most states you have to register somewhere to be a quarry. So if you've got the if you've got the geological locations of where the quarries are in the state, and you've got the, um, in the geographic location of where the quarries are, and you've got the geological profiles of the parent material, you can then begin to go and say, okay, these are the five different parent materials we can access for two bucks a ton. And you, and you assess those. So you, you assess those and you say, okay, and then you overlay that on your soil. So you're talking about doing a total, total assay of your soil, like a, like a total digest of your soil. So in, and then you, ideally you want to do that like, like a three foot deep assessment. Like I'm going to see what is and is not in my soil. So strategically what you would do for the state, this is what you would do. If somebody had 50 grand say, which is, a, you know, basically nothing, we could look at the, at, the, at the land in the state and we could say in this part of the state, at for the top three feet, there's basically not much of these five things. And <clears throat> there's these five quarries which have those things in this waste product. And so we could systemically say for all this part of the state, you guys need to apply two tons per acre of this rock dust to address all these deficiencies. I mean, that would be the systemic strategic way to go about this, but it does involve people working together. And it does involve some open sourcing and it does involve some like money being spent for the greatest good. So who's gonna come up with that? And that's been the issue. That's been the issue across the country with a lot of the things we're proposing is even though it would be empower a bunch of people, who's gonna pony up the money up front for everybody's benefit? Who's gonna write the grant proposal, et cetera? Um, I think I've left a couple loose ends in my storyline, but I've got questions. Um, I'm just very quickly, and this is a remineralization endeavor, so it's really a one-time. Precisely. A, Maybe every 20 years. years yeah, yeah. This is not an annual thing. Yeah. That's a very important point. Yeah. Is we're not talking about NPK. We're talking about minerals in the soil, and sure, they can get worn out over decades or centuries. But if you've got a well-functioning ecological system that's being cycled, the more you've got carbon and you've got structure in your soil, the more these things get cycled and made, made bioavailable. And then it's just, you address the deficiencies, you bring it up to a level of like sufficiency, and then you don't have to worry about it again. And right? just to follow up on that, yeah. don't tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. If you've got the microbial life active in there, that's yeah. helping keep the minerals located and not leaching out over time. That's true. Biological life. So foundationally, when you're putting rock dust down, it's not soluble. Right. So this is a problem, right? Because it's not bioavailable. And so realistically, what you want it to do, it, if, until it goes through a biological digestion process, it does not become bioavailable. But generally, it does not become soluble either. It just it gets put from a crystalline matrix into a biological matrix. 
So strategically, if you do make compost, which we haven't talked about compost, like this would be a really good thing to put into your compost pile, right? You take your two tons per acre of rock dust and you're making a big compost pile, you stick it in there and they digest it. And then you spread that out in your land and you've got it much more bioavailable. So these are sort of like the so put the, put these, these rocks. Amendments. Yep. In the compost pile. Rock dust. Rock Bam. Rock dust. Massive. Salt. So, wow. Salt as well. Or? We'll talk about salt in a second. Yes. But you could you could basically do naturopaths process to it, especially at one time event. You're dialing, you already don't get the problem. Just take all of them, mix them together, put them all in there. Why take the time to mix all the quarry dust together, do a one time application with a percentage of them mixed together, and you're gonna get about the same result. I, I mean people do it different ways. I'm of the opinion, like it's rock dust, it's not bioavailable. It's a question of like cost of, yeah. Yeah, because the actual rock dust doesn't cost much at all. Sure. The trucking costs money, unless you got a truck, and that doesn't cost much money. Then the spreading, how many acres are you spreading on? Anybody got 2,000 acres? Like a couple tons per acre? That looks like work to me. Yeah, so, but, you know, but two tons versus 10 tons is a, I mean, 10 tons per acre or 2,000 acres is a bunch of work. You just said the one thing you should be bringing in is this. Yes. That's where you should be putting your money at almost and, cost. And 10 tons per acre yeah. is a lot of hauling back and forth, is a lot of spreader activity. But it could be a, put in a program. You could do X sure. on year, yep, yep, yep. whatever. And so, and some people are like, this makes tons of sense. I'm gonna go for it, whole hog. And some people are like, I got 20 bucks an acre to spend Yep. as the edge of my budget and I need to be strategic about how I prioritize it. And it's not my business to say what's right, what's wrong. Yeah. I want to be able to sort of, my objective is to convey the, the, the spectrum of opportunities and hopefully different people are feeling inspired about different things. So if something inspires you, I don't know if I said this yet, I don't think I've said this yet. Whatever touches you is what you're supposed to do. It's not like there's a right thing. It's like you are the antenna for your land, right? You are the keeper of the well-being of your land. Your land, like, is like whether you know it or not, like you're tuned into it. And so, when something strikes you, this is my this is my belief. This is my philosophical framework. When there's something like I get I get chills, like that one really excites me. That's your answer, right? Because some things I'll say like you're not responding, and other people are getting totally excited. That's their answer, right? It's the point is that you discern. That you, would, that you hear all these things and that certain things come to you and certain things don't come to you. And so, yeah, for you, it's like, bring it on, let's go. <laughs> and that guy over there with 2,000 acres, he's like, 10 tenths of the acre? Sounds like a ton of work to me. Yeah. I'd rather do five pounds of borax what's, per acre. What kind of, what's the size of everybody that's in here? That's sort of vegetable it varies. It varies. Yeah. It varies massively. Tiny to good. It varies massively. Well, and the crop too is gonna, how many dollars per acre can you afford? Something, but how much of one plant uses might be different from another plant, and you don't always have the full biological system we'd like to have of, yeah. of major crops. And it's and and you know this is this is not like a finished science. This has not been figured out yet. Like if you go to geologists and you say, okay, what happened here twenty million years ago? They're like this, 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 and. And you go up three feet in the geological record, you say, what happened here? And they're like, they're like this, this, this. Like geology, they kind of figured it out, right? It's a finished science. They don't, there's not a lot left to figure out of what happened when, because they basically figured it all out. We're talking about biological systems here. We're talking about Westerners who've lost their indigenousness. And like, and it, right? Well, actually, because we all are indigenous to yes, the planet. Um, which is a whole other conversation. Um, again, one of the ones I like to leave till the end. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think it matters at all. Whatever, I'm not gonna go there. Um, I will go there later. Um, so yeah, it's, we're learning, we're relearning, we're remembering, we're sharing. Ideally, this is a process of learning together. It's not like I have the answer. I'm pretty sure there's some important points here. And ideally, there's a collective that's coming together and coalescing and coordinating and sharing over time and experimenting. The real answer is when nature says this is working by having things do more well, then that's your guidepost, right? Not some guy in front of you. Yeah. Um, I think to me, you stated it correctly that 
Good. As a grower, you have the pulse, you, you have the feeling of your own life. And one thing is observation. Observation, observation. Use your eyes. Walk out. Go to the field. Step somewhere and take observations. If you see something, note it down at the back of your mind or even if you have to write it down because that's what we need to be looking for. And then there is no one system fits all. Yeah. You have to treat each and everything differently and apply the principles. Now coming back to what you, you mentioned, I think the other thing that I would recommend is the baseline is do a soil test. That's what I yeah. always recommend. Do a soil test. It's not going to kill you doing it. It's because 30 bucks or whatever. Exactly. It's a baseline. It's, it's a baseline. In That's five years, you know you'll have context if you have a baseline. Exactly. If you don't have a baseline, you won't have context. Exactly. So do a soil yeah. test, have the baseline, and then from there, build it up. And ask yeah. questions. That is what I normally say. Ask questions. Yeah. And, uh, and send that soil sample to five different labs. Yeah. Also, yeah. for context. <laughs> right? If you've got a hundred bucks, just spread it out, you know? I mean, so, and I think one last thing I would add to that is experiment. Like, okay, I think I want to do two tons breaker. I'm going to do 10 tons breaker over here and 500 pounds breaker over there. And I'm going to see if I notice any, any difference. Right, so that's the other thing, is to experiment. Don't just do the same thing everywhere, experiment. All good farmers, experiment. Yeah. Now the other experiment that I'm interested in is, okay, two times per acre of dust. Yeah. How much has that been incorporated into a compost pile? Yes. It could be a, a, a way It'll at least compost. double the bioavailability, if not yeah. quadruple or quintuple, yeah. the bioavailability by putting it through the compost system. Yeah. But it depends on how, how functional your, your soil biology is. If your soil biology, I mean, so on my farm, I'll just say, like, you know, people talk about, are you, you know, do you have animals on your farm and things like that. So if you're certified organic, you know, you're not allowed to run chicken tractors in your cropland, basically, because it has to be, I think it's 90 and 120 days. So if you're, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a tomato that you're picking, you can't have had an animal poop on the land 90 days before the tomato was picked. Um, and if it's a carrot that's picking out of the ground, it's 120 days. And I'm not sure what your guys' growing season is like up here, but my growing season <laughs> does not say you can run chicken tractors through the field and then plant your crops and get a, and get a harvest. So from a practical standpoint, it's illegal to integrate animals into my farm except for the minor point of birds that fly over and rodents that run under. And I like to talk about earthworms. So pretty sure earthworms are animals. Um, and you know, people talk about compost. I don't use compost. It's a pain in the butt. It's expensive. It's a hassle. Um, people have heard of earthworm castings. You know, earthworm castings, earthworm poop, right? Yeah. Animal manure, which means that it's illegal to sell the tomatoes because I've got animals pooping in my land. Don't talk about that? Don't talk about that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Logic? <laughs> Pretty sure they're animals too, aren't they? Yeah, how about those uh, little springtails and things? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's an animal. Oh, oh, oh. That, not certified, can't sell it. The hypocrisy of the systems is so... <laughs> which is not soil, it's dirt. All right, so the point I want to make is, at night, for me, in June, I want to go out with a flashlight um, and I don't turn it on, I go out to the garden, and then I turn it on. And I'm not sure anybody else, has, but you guys have this happen, but for me, like you turn the flashlight on in the middle of summer, out at night, and there's earthworms. Anybody ever seen earthworms going at it? Right, they're hermaphrodites, so they're like, they get to connect in both ways, and they're just like on six inch centers. Six inch centers, there's, there's sex going on everywhere, <laughs> right? It's like boom, 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 everywhere. They go, so, moisture. what's that? So that takes moisture. Yeah. Well, you guys have moisture. <laughs> I tell you, Appalachia is where it's at. Um, Our first version were private. Yeah. <laughs> you have no more private. You ain't got none. It goes all summer long. It's quite impressive. It goes for quite some time. So anyway, Diverse. but the point is, I think it's like 18 night crawlers per square yard. 
equals 40,000 pounds of earthworm castings per acre per year. 40,000 pounds, that's 20 tons. So people talk about adding lots of organic matter, lots of compost. There's these people that are like, I'm a no-till farmer and I'm like putting out 50 tons of compost per acre. Like, okay, like that's not gonna work in the global context. Applying 50 tons of compost per acre is not, it's not plausible for most places because we don't have that much organic matter waste product to build that much compost with. But in my experience, if my soil is doing well, I'm getting tens of tons of earthworm castings, which are way better than compost, applied for free by my biological system. And so you put two tons of rock dust down in that environment and you don't need to put it through a compost pile because they're, di they're eating it, they're digesting it, they're pooping it. And so it really has to do with the context of what's going on. If your biological community is in rough shape, then definitely um, make an earthworm pile, put some rock dust in there. That stuff's gonna be a great inoculant. It's gonna be, make it much more bioavailable. But, um, again, context. So that was rock dust, um, sea salt. I started on sea salt. I didn't get to complete it. I do want to complete it. Um, I was saying that the center, the center of the country used to be an ocean. And so there's these like 40 foot deep salt beds underneath like states. And so when they, so you've, you've, you've heard of, of Himalayan sea salt or you've heard of uh, Redmond salt or you've heard of, um, C90 or Celtic salt, you're paying a buck a pound or five bucks a pound or 10 bucks a pound for it. Um, you know, the, the, the Kansas gray salt, which is what I get, costs two bucks a 50 pound bag. It's a hundred bucks a ton, 250 a bag, whatever it is. Um, and most of that is in bagging and shipping. Yeah. Right? It's basically just the ground. Once they get past the soil part, there's this salt layer that's 40 feet thick and they just dig it up. And it basically costs them nothing to dig it up. So that's what I use because it's the least expensive. Sea salt, pretty much is sea salt. It's got 90 elements in it. It's the material with the broadest spectrum of elements in it of anything on the planet, right? What percentage of the planet's surface is covered with seawater? A big part, right? 70, whatever it is. Most of the planet is covered with seawater. So sea minerals like have the full spectrum of elements you would need to address imbalances in the soil. So like, it's not like it has to cost a lot because it's so net, there's so much of it because it's, because it's pre so prevalent, the amount of marketing that's gone into it, as far as I'm concerned, is very low, right? Now, you know how that works? Like you can't make a bunch of money on something that is freely available. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right? So that's why you don't know about it because it's so prevalent. It's like rock dust. There's so many piles of crushed up rock dust laying around in the ecosystem that nobody's marketed it because, you know, once somebody knows about it, they'll go get it somewhere else. Well, what so, about all the plastic in the sea now where that's becoming an issue with the salt? So Kansas sea salt is 50 million years old. It's way less expensive than the stuff that's harvested, so harvested fresh. So you're not to use sea salt as much as like the... the that is sea salt. It just was an right. ocean 50 million years ago. But I'm saying like sort of, yeah, like stuff that's labeled as sea salt. Oh, not so much anymore. Well, right, because you're getting everything that's been introduced to in the last thousand years. I think the most stuff that's labeled sea salt isn't actually harvested yeah. ocean sea salt anymore. Well, I think it's mined in the closet. From my perspective, I don't care. Yeah. It's about the cost. And I'm a farmer. And I see no reason to pay a dollar a pound when I can pay $100 a ton. It's just stupid to pay a dollar a pound when I can pay $100 a ton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, the Kansas gray salt's been protected by the layer above it. Which is the point. The sea salt now, if you're getting it, has been exposed to the radiation and the whatever else. But so is her land. Yeah, so is the well, air. Know, but if you Every drop of rain, it, it has radiation, has, has you know, glyphosate in it. Or 70% of, 70 out of every 100 drops of rain has glyphosate in it, right? Yeah. So environmental pollution is a fact. If we want to be afraid, we could go dig ourselves a hole and hide in it, right? <laughs> Which is not strategic. So I would say being afraid is inappropriate because as I understand it, microbes have the ability to digest anything. Radioactive isotopes, boom. Mycorrhizal fungi, no problem. You know, sludge, PCBs, microplastic, sure. But the point is the amount of microplastics in that is really, really small. Um, if you've got a well-functioning biological ecosystem, 
they'll digest toxins. We, do we have a question about toxins here somewhere? There was a question about toxins. This is an important point. This is a really important point. It's because we have, you know, based on how land has been treated over the past number of decades, all kinds of toxins in the environment. And that's just reality. We've got toxins in our body, we've got toxins in our food, it's everywhere. Feel free to take it outside. Um, so I think that's, that's the point I wanna make here is that when you're working with a biological system, like part of what life does is it takes care of these things as part of the basic, basic role it, it, it you know, accomplishes. Um, I was talking to a woman, I think she lives here now, mostly she's from um, New Zealand. Um, and I was trying to remember her name yesterday. Nicole. Nicole, yes. So she was at our, she spoke at our conference last year and we were talking about this thing about uh, glyphosate um, Roundup and organic and not organic. And she's been doing this work with, with growers on scale. And uh, I think this is a really important point. Um, she was referring to growers that were growing wheat and exporting to Europe, and they were certified organic, they're not using glyphosate, and their wheat was rejected by the European market because they had residue of glyphosate in it. Not from the soil, not from the application, but from the rain. And she was talking about conventional quote unquote producers, which regenerative, whatever, who were using cover crops, um, not doing tillage, they were you know, doing a burn down with glyphosate in the spring and then growing wheat and harvesting it and it passed the test. So even though those conventional producers were applying glyphosate this year as a burn down of their cover crops, because the biological system was functioning so well, that got digested and was not present. Along with the stuff that was in the rain that landed on the organic farmers fields, it landed on their fields too. So the point is, we may have toxins in the environment, but what microbes can do is they can break them down, digest them, and remove them, right? All that glyphosate is, is some copper and some boron and some, you know, so, some carbon and some oxygen and some hydrogen. Right? All of these toxic compounds are based out of elements. And what microbes can do is they can digest them into their component parts and make them no longer toxic. And that will only happen when you have a well-functioning biological system. And if you till on a regular basis, you're destroying that biological system and you know, your crops are actually more toxic. This is what I'm saying as an organic farmer, right? As an organic farmer, as someone who's always been certified organic, I've never, never applied synthetic materials on my farm. The fact of the matter is that the management practices are such in a lot of organic production that the net effect is negative on multiple levels. Right? Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. right, I wanted to make that point. And that's what the schmuck stack of a pond, the squishy stuff in your toes at the bottom does, is it eats all that stuff before that water goes down into the system. Into the system. It's, it's microbial life that eats all of that. It's everywhere. That yeah. So it's all about making that, managing the environment to facilitate as much microbiology as possible. Right? In the olden days, we got taught we were supposed to be afraid of germs. Anybody heard of that one? <laughs> afraid of germs? How many microbes have we been exposed to for how many million years before they invented, you know, hand sanitizing soap? <laughs> right? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody? Or just plain soap. Or, I mean, not to go push the envelope too far, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I mean, the vast majority of microbes in the environment are symbiotes. Yeah. There's, there are some that are pathogens. When the environmental condition is such, their job is to take you out because you're not fit to maintain. Your, to maintain. It's not that the microbes are bad, it's just that you're so weak that they're now a challenge for you because nature thinks you shouldn't be around anymore. You should be pissed at nature, not pissed at the microbes. <laughs> but according to her rules, you're not fit, right? That's the dynamic at play. It's your diet though, so you should be pissed at your diet. You could be, being pissed doesn't help, right? It's just the wrong attitude, <laughs> right? Like, you're right. That's for starters. <laughs> Anyway, so I digress. I've been going on all kinds of digressions. <laughs> Theoretically, we're talking about minerals. I've covered a lot of bases. Um, you find as soil health increases, your biological system increases, that you need to use less than that? Is that kind of stuff that you would jumpstart the system with? Yeah. That was exactly the point that was made okay. back here. Yes, by okay. or, or two or three or times. Or, yeah. If you're doing something like boron to the point of toxicity of boron, you may have a very low level of boron. You're not going to be doing a rock dust application. I'm going to say, do not 
apply all that boron you need at once. In fact, there's a couple slides, if we can get to those slides, that say maximum yearly application. Mm -hmm. Bottom of page two, and then page three. It says the title, maximum yearly application, max yearly application, max yearly application, max yearly application, max yearly application. Max yearly application. So the point is, all at once is not necessarily the best way to do this. When it comes to these things that you're buying in bags, slow and steady is the way to do it. Um, there's lots of examples of people who will put down, I mean, we do the math on manganese, so we're not gonna do it. I, I, I gave you the basic here. We can do the, you can you know, figure it out later, but manganese is a great example because if you do the math, most people need 25 years of max applications of manganese to get to where they should be. But if they do that max application and then they take a soil test next year, all of a sudden, there's way more manganese in their soil next year than the addition that they just added in manganese sulfate. And this is what happens is microbes, once they get going, start to take care of the whole system. And I just wanna say this, there's all kinds of different parent materials, parent rock, right? There's sandstone, there's, there's uh, limestone, there's granite, there's basalt. You can look around the, the planet at different parent rock materials, and then you can look at the soil that is what the plants grow in. And those parent rock materials are made out of totally different things, but the soil is remarkably uniform. So somehow, <coughs> somehow, different parent materials are being converted into a similar, you know, life matrix. And this is what we talk about, you know, magic powers, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow about microbes. So yes, I would say in general, you know, slow and steady is the, is the point. Do a little bit, check back in, do a little bit more, check back in. Um, when it comes to the rock dust and naturally occurring materials, you can do maybe a larger dose because they're not soluble, um, et cetera. So How yeah. about the salt? Like salt, the, yes. Applying the salt, do you do that in the same way? So sea salt, uh, my general rule is 75 pounds per acre. Um, and sodium is something you guys would need to worry about out here where it doesn't rain too much. I think I've got a max target level of sodium. So you can look at that as, a, as like, okay, when my sodium levels get too high, then I need to start being worried. Um, there are also ways you can take out the sodium and chlorine from sea salt and just get the trace elements. I can give you that recipe if you want. But, um, I have a question about application. Yes. So if we're not going to mix it with compost because yeah. I don't have any. Um, or don't want to. Yeah. Or, well, it's not that I don't want to. I just yeah. Don't um, so is it just like a sprinkle? Like you get it out, you just rake it over and call it good? On my scale, it's called a five gallon bucket. Um, depending on what you're looking. So I'm like 20 acres. Um, yeah, I mean, you got a spreader. Yeah, um, spreader. Okay. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure if it required any type of delivery system. Or sorts. Get it out. Yeah, I mean, just get it out there, and nature will take care of it, okay. is my strategy. And I personally, my farm, I go from stone wall to stone wall. You don't have stone walls out here. But we have stone walls, um, and, you know, if I've got 15 acres, two of that is flat enough and not rocky. So so not rocky, you can actually work it. So there's 13 that are rocky and not flat, and when I'm doing my minerals, I go stone wall to stone wall. Because I'm not doing this for the cropland, I'm doing this for the ecosystem. Right. I want my entire ecosystem to be functioning at a high level. And you guys have, you have goldenrod out here? You know what goldenrod is? Yeah, goldenrod? So when I bought my farm, the goldenrod was yay high. Goldenrod, but it wasn't looking particularly feisty. Now the goldenrod is like eight feet tall. Like all the weeds, all the things that grow up, they just, the, the level of vitality in the ecosystem is ridiculous. And when you put these trace elements in, like especially the seawater, because the seawater has all naturally occurring elements. I haven't talked about enzymes yet, but when you get all these enzyme systems functioning, we don't look at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 different elements, but nature can use them to do amazing things. The lanthanide group, anybody know about the periodic table of elements? Do you know those, the periodic table? Right, yeah. that like thing, the, at the bottom is these two lines yeah. that stick out, right? The actinide group and the lanthanide group. You start getting those things in, those guys have like, the geometry is ridiculous. It's not icosahedral, dodecahedral, it's like 100-sided geometry. At the center, I mean, use that as center of enzymes. I'm probably not making any kind of sense, but it's really cool what happens when you get a broad spectrum of trace elements into the ecosystem. Things start happening that are really impressive. And all I can say is, don't take my word for it. If you think it's worth 
investigating, experiment. If you think it's worth investigating, experiment. Take a little spot, do a, some sea salt here, take another spot, do a bunch of sea salt there, do some of this green sand over here, do some rock dust over there, and see what you see. And save your seed, of course. We haven't talked about seed yet, but. <laughs> that's really important. Sorry, that's not mine. This is mine over here. All right, what time do we have? 10 to 3. 10 to 3. All right. Um, look at that seed coming right up. Uh, page 4. Um, let me see, what I, is there anything I'm not covered on minerals? Yeah. Can I ask a quick question about salt before the blend? Yeah. In our area, we have saline seeds. Um, saline seeps. Yeah. Yeah. There's like sodic soil and saline. Yeah. Which are different, but so from my perspective, not knowing a lot about the saline yeah. part, like I'm thinking there's already an excess of salt. That that's entirely like, possible. What, it's entirely possible. Is there a difference between what the white stuff that's accumulating on the top of the saline seed versus the salt that you're suggesting be applied? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I really have very little experience out here, and I know you guys have hot springs and things like this. What the oh, hell is yeah. that? Maybe you can check that out. Yeah. I've heard. <laughs> I have this bad habit of having too much going on, so I just go from here to there to there to there to there to there to there to there. I did take a vacation this year for the first time in 15 years. That was, that was a bit of an experience. Uh, all right, back to work. <laughs> no. Um, yes, so this is, an, this is an issue because you have, you have these salt deposits and um, sodium is an issue, right? I mean, high, high sodium is, is potentially a serious issue, so. Um, I thought um, some of the sodium issue was from well water and a lot of farmers and ranchers you see um, from well water, they get crusty on the top of the surface of the soil because the, salt, the water isn't ready to come out kind of into the world, it hasn't been through the filtration. <laughs> Processes like normal, and so I. And let me ask that. That's my same question. So, yeah. Is that a different? Well, that's a, that's an that's an interesting piece there. When you're talking about water, and what's in the water. Yeah. If you've got lots of minerals in the water, so what happens out here is you know where I live, we have so much water that it any excess nutrients get leached out. They get they go down, and. Here, if you're watering and then, you know, most of the, most of the water goes up, it doesn't go down. Right. And so when the water evaporates, all the minerals that were in the water are left on the surface and that's your white crusty stuff, mm -hmm. which can be a serious problem and can, can cause land to be basically difficult to grow on, mm -hmm. right? That's so cool. big issue. Mm -hmm. So what do you do about that? This is a practical thing I think I can help you with. What's that? We need more rain. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that's where it comes to the water cycle thing. But for now, you're irrigating. And so what do you do about it? Um, and the basic thing you do is you buffer it. So there's this thing called uh, humates. Anybody heard of humates? Humic acid, fulvic acid, you've heard of probably. People will sell them as liquids, and they're fairly expensive. But that's because it's a processed product. So I would say go back to the source. What is a humate? Anybody know what a humate is? How they come from? Yeah. So it's okay. So so. Um, yes, exactly. Um, so you know what coal is, and you know what peat moss is, and do you understand in theory that peat moss over time and pressure gets turned into coal? So somewhere in the middle there, between time and pressure, not all the way done, is is humates, leonardite. It's soft brown coal. And it's a, something that is mined. It's a geological resource, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's dug up out of the ground. And it's got a ridiculously large exchange, ex exchange capacity. It's basically you know, organic matter on steroids. It's got all these benefits of organic matter. It's just amazing bonding sites. It can hold all kinds of stuff. So it can hold it there. And it's available for biological systems if biological systems need it, but it's not soluble and burning stuff. So what humates can do is they can basically buffer any of these excesses. Anything that's present in too high of a level can get held by the humates. And so it's, it doesn't burn things. Does it help with chlorine too? Absolutely. So if you've got city water, if you've got chlorinated, fluorinated water, which is, what are they, why do they put the chlorine in the water? To kill life. What do we say was the foundation of this whole process? Building life. So putting things in water that kill life means you don't really want that water in your soil, 
right? We talked about giving your, your baby antibiotics. Like, give your baby antibiotics on a daily basis and tell me how their gut flora is doing, right? Water your seedlings with chlorinated water on a daily basis and tell me how their gut flora is doing. All make sense? Yeah. So what you do is you take humates, which are a mined material, and in some places they're just like, they have, when they're doing the mountaintop removal in like West Virginia, like a lot of what they're removing is the humates. Like they gotta push that all off into the hole to get to the coal. But while they're at it, you might as well take the stuff that they're pushing off anyways, and it's pretty damn inexpensive. And so if you get that, if you get the humates themselves, like the, the, the hard, like the, 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 the dry, the thing you would dig up out of the ground, they're actually pretty soft. Um, and you can do it like low tech or you can do it high tech, but you can basically take those humates, crush them up and mix them with water. And you've got an amazing material that can be used to buffer anything, any excesses in water, any excesses in an irrigation system that can be put into a, into a center pivot irrigation system. It can be put into any irrigation system. So if you've got a little hose on, if you're in a backyard garden in the city environment, you can stick that into like a little hose on thing that like screws into your irrigation line. It can suck the humates in and buffer the, and buffer the chlorine or fluorine. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, but if you were in a backyard situation, you know, those, um, you know those like square metal pounder things that like landscapers use for stuff. Like if you're making a patio, you know, that, it's oh, like a, yeah, a tam tam yeah, sure, tamper, right? So take that, if you got a cement, you got floor somewhere, garage, like, so you dump your humates on the floor, you take your tamper, boom, 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 turn it in from little chunks into powder, you know, take a shovel, scoop it up, put it in a five gallon bucket, add water. You get liquid humates. So, That's way less expensive than buying fulvic acid and humic acid. And it'll basically do the same thing. So on whatever scale you want, that's all you have to do. Even like for water that is like high in calcium. Exactly. Yeah. Water that's high in anything. Yeah. It'll buffer it. Like you can't, it's really hard to take it out of the water. But this, if, if the humates are in the water, they'll hold that. They'll like, it's not that it's gone. It's just that it's connected to the organic compound. So you want it on a continuous to your water system yes. versus it's, and it's not once it's out there it can filter the water when like it's not like a one time application and then it's If you got if you if you're dealing with water that has too much of something in it mm -hmm. this would be a continuous, a continuous feed. Yeah. Okay. And so you buy a 50 pound bag of humates for 15 bucks and you pound that up into powder and you I mean <laughs> yeah it's my, am I doing too much shorthand or you guys have enough of practical experience you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Enough of you do. Mm -hmm. My yes. experience has been that that stuff is fairly hydrophilic or phobic. It doesn't, it doesn't solubilize or in water. I don't want it to solubilize. I want it to stand in suspension. Okay. Um, it's not going to solubilize. So fumic acid and, and fulvic acid, you can buy them in little quarts, you can buy them in jars, and they cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of money. They don't buy that. Get the raw thing, pound it into powder, put the powder in a five gallon bucket, add water to the five gallon bucket, and that water's gonna get dark colored. If it's more convenient, I mean, some people don't have the means to get that. If, it's, so if you got the money and you're on a small scale, yeah. You, you can buy them. And buy liquid humates, yeah. They do totally, absolutely. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy stuff, I'm just saying from a farmer's perspective, anybody who is a farmer, one of the things that like is the best way to make a living is to stop spending money. <laughs> like if you have an outgo is two hundred dollars per acre and an income is three hundred dollars per acre, your net's one hundred dollars an acre. If you have an outgo that's twenty dollars an acre and an income that's two hundred dollars an acre, your, your income is one eighty. Right. So it's it's not just how much you're making; it's how much you're spending. And I think farmers, in many cases, have been. You know, what do they say? They're the only people that buy retail and sell wholesale, right? It's just bad business. But we are, you know, I, I would say farmers are like being harvested by the system. Yeah. And so that's because we don't know, you know, how to be independent. Like we don't, we don't know enough about what we're doing to know what the, what the key things are to do to basically make it so we don't need to be buying all that stuff in the first place. Cultivated. We're cultivated. 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 <laughs> Modified. <laughs> <laughs> Indoctrinated. <laughs> you can find all kinds of words. Yeah, we'll all be harvested. 
Uh, yeah, right? well, culturally, of course. With uh, social media, we are deprived. <laughs> That's why one should have certain boundaries which involve not engaging, right? Personally, the I- The point of that is that there's a mindset in our culture that that's the economy and it's okay. We've all said that's okay. We've passively accepted it. And well, so when you're- say, wait a minute, this model is not working for us. When you're trained from childhood to sit still, shut up, repeat after me, you're you know, <laughs> and and you get, you get positive reinforcements for repeating after me, that we are not taught to tune into our own insight, to run around outside, to learn from our elders, you know, to learn from nature. It's a brilliant system. I mean, you gotta give them respect. To be happy, you gotta find it out there and ourselves. We'll put it together. Anyway, so, sodic soils was a great point to bring up and the salt seeps and stuff that's in water. Is there anything else in the topic of minerals? Quick question on the humic. If yeah. we have available, we have it available and cheap, already ground up, can't we just spread it on the soil? Um, I mean, I, it's, I would say humates are great to spread on soil, but um, it's a question of cost. Yeah, well, so, just... yeah, I mean, if you've, if you've got a quarter acre, you know, and you've got an extra 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever you want to throw in your land, like, so, humates, they make the soil silky. Anybody ever been like, I've done this with, a, with hoop houses where I've just like had the, I've had the drip line have humic acid or hum, liquid humates go into the drip line continuously, you do that for like two or three months, every time you irrigate the hoop house, the soil, when it just has this like, I don't know how to say it, it's like a silky consistency. It's just like, oh, it's like just a pleasure to touch. So yeah, humates are amazing things. How do you inject that in your system? Um, any kind of fertilizer injector or um, irrigation. I mean, any system that's designed to add fertilizer to an irrigation line will take water that has liquid humates or, you know, <coughs> finely ground water humates standing in suspension and we'll just we'll integrate it. So up, up on the Arm Montana, we have a place that has a bog that digs that out. Yeah. And he said that when I was up there, he's got a brown layer and a, and a darker brown layer. Yeah. It's just probably right on top of that humates. It yeah. probably has humates in it. Yeah. Right out of the lake up there like us. It's, I mean, these are naturally occurring materials. They're all over the place and we can be cycling them. So Dan, what are your thoughts on just like putting down a layer of uh, humates on the soil if you don't have a way to add it to your water? Can you just put it down a layer? Five and gallon the bucket. Water goes through it, spread it up. Uh, I would, if, you, if you've got, I mean, if, depending on the scale of your operation, there's a thing called a hose-on and there's other things like it. It goes like, it's H-O-Z-O-N. H-O-Z-O-N. And it screws into to a, to a garden hose. And it's got a little tube sticking out of it. Mm -hmm. It costs 25 or 30 bucks. And then you do. You've got a tool for doing okay. that. It, it's, it's, a, it's a, there's many levels of expense in this kind of infrastructure. But if you're gonna be irrigating anyways, through any kind of an irrigation line, um, for, for short money, you can get something that does this kind of thing. <laughs> And that's how you, you put the humates in there and it... So you stick them in a, it's, you know, it's, where's my hose? Um, you know, it's basically screws in. So it's about this size. It's got a little tube sticking out of it. And the tube, you dump a tube in a bucket. And so it just, it just siphons. So here's, uh, everything's purple. It's kind of hard to see. Um, <laughs> He's got a picture. What's that? He's got a picture. You got, you got one, okay. <laughs> The, the internet is available to many people, yeah. so you can find yeah, these things. Really yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was so, thinking, I was being sarcastic. Humans in solid form, they are very light. I mean, not heavy at all, right? They're fairly light, yeah. So, I mean, spreading <coughs> in solid form in our environment, if it's a windy, we could get 25, 30 miles an hour wind. Mm -hmm. You lose all that. I mean, it's usually a bad idea to spread finely powdered fine powders in a windstorm. Yeah. So yeah. Find a way of kind of so wait till it's misty. Yeah. I mean, you guys don't have mist, so. Um, <laughs> Put it on the snow. I want to get snow. Yeah. I'll, I mean, it doesn't look tell. It's simple It doesn't soak yet. I always stand upwind, and I'm happy if it shit's going off into the forest. Personally, it's going into the environment. If it's a beneficial thing for my garden, it's beneficial for the environment. And so I don't mind, if it's inexpensive, my objective is to hit as much of the ecosystem as possible. But I have a habit of going over my fence line on accident. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's one thing if it's chemicals, it's another thing if it's yeah, nutrients. No. Yeah. The, the neighbor has a habit of doing the same thing for opposite reasons. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I want to see if I can do at least one more topic before the break because we're making good progress, but we are do have many topics left to accomplish before the end of the day. So if there's nothing else left on minerals, I'm going to move forward. Um, can we give me a time check? 315. 308. 308. Okay. Um, so the next slide here, slide number 20, says um, Bionutrient Food Association. I do like to try to take at least a few minutes to um, talk about what we're doing organizationally. I think I covered it to some decent degree um, in my intro this morning about my personal life, which is kind of the organization because I have really bad boundaries about who I am versus what I'm doing with the organization. But um, <laughs> So the BFA, I said, we're 10, 12 years old, where our mission is to increase quality in the food supply. Um, that means, you know, flavor, aroma, nutritive value. Um, the concept is figure out some way to increase the ambient level of nutrition in food planet-wide. So next year, food is on average better than last year or this year, and the year after that, better again. And so part of our strategy has to do with this definition of nutrient density. I talked about the labs and that, and that has to do with the meters. So we can, and then the consumer. So we have the buyer actually driving it through a, a sort of a pull through, through economic self-interest um, to the producer. Um, I think I might've mentioned something about, you know, chronic illness and disease. Um, my opinion is that, um, anybody heard of this thing? Um, what's his name? Uh, Maslow? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it's this sort of framework that says people will, you know, take care of their own survival first before they deal with like quality of life, before they deal with cultural health, before they deal with, you know, spiritual evolution, right? Like paying the bills is the first thing you deal with. Enlightenment is the last thing you deal with. You know, the environment is somewhere closer to enlightenment than it is to paying the bills. From a practical standpoint, most people bother themselves with survival first. And so, um, roof over your head, food to eat, things like that. Um, so, for better or for worse, I would say we are at a point in you know, cultural history where there is a epidemic level of chronic illness. We have many people themselves, their families, their children, somewhere, their neighbors, um, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis, you know, hormonal imbalances, psychological imbalance, whatever, whatever all these things are, um, they're becoming more and more prevalent. Um, average lifespans are decreasing now. Um, you know, what percentage of people are going to have cancer and diabetes and um, heart disease in 2040 is like 150 percent. Like, like everybody's going to have it, and then a couple people are going to have two or three of them. Like children, you know, we're seeing this chronic level of disease, and so. That, to me, is more like survival than it is enlightenment. That's more like a visceral self-interest thing. And maybe you yourself are doing okay, but you've got four kids and one of them is not doing very well. Or you've got a spouse or something like that who's not doing well. And in my mind, these are the kind of things that are real visceral drivers in our lives. Like, I don't care about much. If my child is sick, I'm going to take care of that first. Um, so I don't care much about, <laughs> you know, Politics, if I've got cancer, I'm gonna focus on that. I'm gonna work on that. Um, so for better or for worse, it seems to me, um, we have this visceral self-interest of, of survival of ourselves and, our, and those we immediately care about, um, which is getting more and more prevalent. It's just more and more pressing. And so um, to my mind, that is a very powerful driver in our actions. And we talk about climate, we talk about carbon markets, we talk about ecosystem service markets. Um, you know, people may be familiar with these sort of broader conversations. Um, I, you know, I look at the, I, mean, I guess I had a question about this, I'll try to, I'll try to weave it in here. Um, people may be familiar with this whole carbon credits conversation. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people that are working on this, that are working on databases and structures for assessing and meters and certifications and, and, and you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact price of a carbon, a ton of CO2 is right now. I think it's like 20 bucks or in that ballpark. Um, and, you know, farmers that are doing a really good job are maybe sequestering three or four tons of carbon per acre. That's like, it's possible. We can do three or four tons per acre per year, right? 
the general assumption is it's like a half a ton or one ton is a, as a, tar as a target number. So if a ton is 20 bucks an acre, and we'll say that's you know doing well, like 20 bucks an acre a year, it's not that big of an economic incentive, right? It's just not that much. And the amount of hassle involved in certification and assessment and verification means the farmer's getting five bucks out of that. So if we're talking about economics being a driver, I don't think carbon is the most powerful driver for that ecological benefit. Um, in my mind, it's the quality of the food, because as I understand it, um, you know, as you get premiums, if you were to get a 20% premium on your wheat yield, that would be worth a lot more than $20 an acre. Right. So my thought is, if we can align the economic self-interest for the producer, as in you get serious premiums for the quality of your food, um, which also correlates with the carbon sequestration and everything else, then we've got a powerful vector. So broadly, that's what we've been working on strategically in this nutrient density space is that alignment between people are sick and they understand that there's something wrong with their food and they can actually choose the food that's better for them. And that directly goes to the farmers getting paid premiums for how they treat the soil. Um, broadly, this is our strategic objective, um, is to try to align these self-interests in a more visceral way than what's being put out there right now, which is the carbon and ecosystem service markets. Um, so that's broad. Um, I refer referenced it earlier. I don't want to spend too much time on it right now. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, organizationally, we have done courses. We've got a conference. We do local chapters. I just had somebody here, where are you? Offer to work on a local chapter? There you are, Heidi. Yes. So we got local chapters all over the country, people who basically say, this is cool, I wanna work on this. You know, I've talked about, you know, the, the rock dust thing. Like, how do we coordinate a region to identify what's in your, what's in your soil, what's not in your soil, what's in your, you know, your quarries? Like, if we can facilitate decentralized coordination as a collective, as a community, we can take ownership of our bioregions, we can educate, we can facilitate these dynamics. And so um, that's one opportunity here is to um, engage in that kind of a fashion. So I'm not sure if you want to name yourself or raise your hand again or not, stay hidden. Yeah, my name is Sadie Collins, and I'm from the Willis Hall, which is kind of close to everything. And she's interested in, in, you know, being a leader in this process. We've got people all over the country who are basically grounding local coordinations in partnership with the BFA. It's a bottom-up thing. We don't tell you what to do, but we support a, plus, a process of collaboration. So I'll put that out there for anybody who's interested. Um, you're putting yourself out there. Thank you very much, much appreciated. You reached out in February and I apparently blew you off. So um, take two, uh, here we go. Um, so, all right, we've got, um, yeah, I think I don't need to say too much more about our organizational efforts because I referenced them earlier, but I'm happy to take a couple of questions about the BFA. Yeah. Um, to your sicknesses, most of those sicknesses that we're worried about are, are how they're gut mild in the first place. Um, and correlate with mineral deficiencies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the chronic illness, if you track it all back, goes down to eczema. boron deficiency, manganese oh. deficiency, copper deficiency, cobalt deficiency. If you begin to get these minerals back into the system, then the microbes, right? The microbes need these minerals just like we do. Yeah. You know, glyphosate ties up the manganese, ties up the copper, ties up the cobalt. Right, when, the, when the glyphosate ties these minerals up, then they're not present, then the microbes can't function, then we get, a, we get an unhealthy gut microbiome. It's, it's all beautifully interrelated. I say M&Ms, <laughs> microbes and minerals. You know, you need, you can't have the microbes without the minerals, you can't have the minerals, so, yeah. And the unclean food we're eating that has that upon it is tying it up in our gut. Uh, I call it junk, not food. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like to say there's a continuum, here's junk, here's food, right? <laughs> Junk food is kind of like a like a contradiction in terms. Like if it's junk, it sure as hell ain't food. So stop calling it food. Stop calling it food. Call it junk. Call it what it is. Yeah, sorry. It's one of my rants. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm interested to hear, I, I guess you've talked about things being open sourced and sort of trying to make sure that that you know your organization doesn't go the way of the organic um, farmer. You know the way that's gone. The movement, and, and sort of yeah, like co-opted. I guess your your philosophy around addressing late stage capitalism. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's my philosophy? <laughs> what, is there a question in there? Or? Um, I'm interested to hear more about your organization and how you're you're addressing um, 
making sure that that this system that you're creating, this open source system, yeah. like, this collaborative organization mm -hmm. with no central real like power. Yeah. Um, how you're developing that in a way that um, won't devolve or hopefully It'd be much more difficult to co-opt. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. So maybe that's a topic for tomorrow or something. No, no. I mean that's I mean we can we can web web it in wherever, but this is the time when we're talking about the organization. This is the only slide in the whole day, two days on the on the BFA. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think I brought this up earlier. I said, you know, um, if 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 something is ownable um, you know, like whatever it is, it's a, a you got a patent or a copyright or whatever. Um, then, if somebody can own it, then they can profit off of it, right? And um, then they can it can control it, and they can manipulate it, they can modulate it, whatever it is the 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 um, the Facebook algorithm or or whatever, right? Um, you know, I'm not sure. There's all kinds of examples of these kinds of things. Um, our thought is that if we have a definition of nutrient density of quality in food that is anything but open, it is likely to get controlled and manipulated over time. <clears throat> so foundationally, we want this understanding about what is exceptional, what is junk, and what is everything in between to be in the commons. We don't want it to belong to a, go a government, to belong to a company. We want it to be an open, you know, a collectively discerned and determined analysis and understanding. And, you know, right now we're just talking about carrots or beef or rice. We're not talking about processed products. We're talking about the thing, milk itself. Um, and what do you do to it afterwards is a whole other conversation. So right now the foundational thing is what's the variation in nutritional value in the milk that comes out of the cow? And that you know, to a large degree, depends on the health of the cow and what her what her experiences were, her mother's health, her microbiome, what she's fed, level of stress she's she's experiencing. All those things go into that variation of nutrient levels. And so, um, and yeah. Whether she's been bred to produce healthy food or lots of it. Whether she's an A one or an A two. I mean, all these things, right? Yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I mean, wheat, right? You've got the the einhorn and the and the and the emmer, and you've got the hybridized, right? I mean, people that have the wheat gluten intolerance, you know, in many cases don't have gluten intolerance to ancient wheat because that's what we evolved to eat. That's not, we didn't evolve to eat what's on the market right now. Food like substance. <laughs> They're called junk. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. So, <clears throat> you know, broadly the vision is, at least right now with the meter, I mean, from a very practical standpoint, um, and I haven't brought it out yet, but we actually can look at it. And, Right here. This is a this is the this is the meter we've got right now. This is the bioenergy meter. Um, it's got a, a ten LEDs in here, an LED light emitting diode, right? It's just and each one emits light at a very specific frequency. So you may have heard of ultraviolet light or visible light or infrared light. Light. These are just different levels, different frequencies. They vibrate at a different speed. And so this has ten different LEDs. One vibrates at you know 360 nanometers. One vibrates at 430 nanometers. One vibrates at 904 nanometers. So it's just a specific type of light. And um, well, we just step back. Spectroscopy. I'm running out of time before our 3:30 break, but whatever. Um, if you were a well, if you were to ask an astrophysicist what Alpha Centauri is made up of which you probably wouldn't do, but just, we'll just play along with me. Uh, you know what astrophysicists are? They're people who study the stars. And you know what Alpha Centauri is? It's the star that's closest to us, it's not the sun. It's, I'm not sure, like six light years away or something? Light years away, which is a decent distance. The things that we have, humans have sent off of planet Earth that are the farthest distance away, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they just passed their 45th birthdays. Um, they are about 18 light hours away. <clears throat> 18 light hours. So Alpha Centauri is six light years away. And that's, that's the closest. So we are looking at shit way beyond Alpha Centauri. But um, if you ask an astrophysicist, what is Alpha Centauri made up of? You wouldn't do that, but just say theoretically, you're like, hmm, what is it? Um, they'll say, well, it's 51% hydrogen. It's 48% helium. It's 1% other gases, these levels and ratios. We know exactly what Alpha Centauri is made up of. And you're like, Alpha Centauri is five light years away, six light years away. How the hell do you know? 
They say, because every element in chemistry is a vibration in physics. Copper vibrates at a certain frequency. Zinc vibrates at a certain frequency. So that frequency is color, is light. So we take a picture of the light coming off of Alpha Centauri and we can see what it's made up of by looking at the kind of light that's coming at us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's spectroscopy. Okay. Spectroscopy is a science that's well developed, it's decades old. It's a way of assessing things. Um, and so what this thing is, is a spectrometer. This is, you know, it basically takes a, well, it flashes light and then it takes a picture of the light that bounces back. And by doing that, it can see what, thing, what things are made up of. And so um, if you're talking about calcium, which is a nutrient in milk or in carrots, um, that will vibrate at a certain frequency. And so when you take a picture of the light bouncing back off a carrot, you can effectively see how much calcium is in it. So what we're doing here with this meter is we're assessing like what's the level of calcium, what's the level of potassium, what's the level of manganese, what's the level of sulfur, what's the level of polyphenols. All these things in chemistry, copper's a thing, quote unquote, in chemistry, is a vibration in physics. So, um, yeah, so right now, this is our strategy, is to give people the ability to see in real time what this carrot is made up of versus that carrot versus that carrot. And my thought is, you got a bunny love and you got a calorganic and you got a bolt house farms bag of carrots on the shelf. If you can flash a light at one, it says 20 out of 100. You flash the light, the next one says 40 out of 100. You flash the next one says 80 out of 100. And you pull the 80 off the shelf and everybody else does, then the retailer is gonna say, we're gonna reorder the bolt house, whatever it is, we're, gonna leave, we're not gonna reorder the Cal organic. And so um, we don't think strategically that we are going to be organi you know, organizationally, like in five years, the company with the meter that everybody's gonna use, because we're not a tech company. We is no way we can compete with Apple and, and Samsung and Google, right? So our objective is not to be building the meters that people are using. Our objective is to have those companies that are making meters calibrated to our data set. Does that make sense? We got a big open data set, which actually says this is what quality is. This is 80, this is 20, this is 90 out of 100. So anybody could build a meter. Hundred percent. In fact, this one is open source, so the specs for how to build it are online, and anyone you can go build one, and you can build a thousand of them, and you can sell them. That's what open source means. Is it means it does not belong to us. Okay. Period. What's that? To get yet? To get yet? Um, <laughs> we are. We are. Uh, 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 what's the word? Um, constantly out of stock. Um, we are building them on a good month at five a week. Um, these are built like, you know, garage style. Um, this is not mass produced. This is like, we're, we're a small nonprofit. We don't have a lot of money. We've been able to pull this off. Um, right now it's shut down on the website. I can promise you that we've got another hundred boards coming back from China in the next two weeks. And so then we're about to put them back up to order on the website in the near future. So. If you're on the, if you, if we have your email address, which I don't have necessarily anybody here's email address, um, but if you go to our website and you give us your email address, you'll get the newsletter when we announce that they're available and you can order one. Um, um, I will say they're janky. Um, they they work, but they're not slick. So if you're used to a smartphone and downloading apps and things being quick, <laughs> do not expect that function from this. Um, where we're at right now is, you know, shy, a minor issue of about three and a half million dollars. Um, they will be slick and quick and available globally in thousands. So that's part of what I'm working on right now behind the scenes. You see me like whenever I'm not talking, get in front of my computer and taking phone calls. It's because I'm working on this project full time. Um, well, well, more than full time. Um, <clears throat> Um, so, I mean, the vision is next year, if you're, say you live in Bozeman and there's, you know, 10 people in Bozeman that have one of these things. Um, let's say there's 10 different stores in Bozeman where you can buy food. Let's say you got a Walmart, you got a, a Trader Joe's, you got a, you got a Whole Foods, you got a, I don't know. A, well, I don't know, I don't know what you got. But I can promise you that Whole Foods is oftentimes not as good as Walmart, so that's all of the conversation. Um, it's very, very interesting what the quality is where. 
I said at the beginning, organic is not necessarily better than non-organic. I can say that in many cases, Walmart's better than Whole Foods. So don't get all pissy about not having Whole Foods. <laughs> what you're doing is not spending so much money. So let me, I got a few more things I want to say here. So I appreciate the question, but you save your, save your shoulder if you want. Um, so the concept is next year or 12 months after we raise that three and a half million dollars, you got 10 people in any given city, each one of them shops once a week at a different store. They are at, you know, um, a volunteer, they're a local chapter member, they go out, they spend an extra 20 minutes every week and they flash a light at every one of the potato options at the store that they go to at every one of the carrot options. And that light gets a reading and it gets kicked into the database. And then everybody in Bozeman has access to that information. So the strategy is, that a few people who will put in a little bit extra energy can, can you know, provide context and perspective to everybody in a bio region. And then we are really, really hoping that you know, this week all the blueberries leave the shelf at Walmart. And they're like, huh, did we not order enough blueberries? And then next week all the carrots leave the shelf at Trader Joe's. And then the next week, whatever it is, I mean, we will have all the data for highs and lows. We don't want to emphasize the low. We want to emphasize the high because that's the whole objective. It's not to embarrass people, but to empower people. And so if you've got 100 people in Bozeman that, are, that go shopping once a week, which is probably more than 100 people that go shopping once a week in Bozeman, right? Yeah. But if they all go, if they're willing to go where the best stuff is and actually engage in the process of pulling it off the shelf, then we apply that economic like driver to the supply chain. And I would suggest in very short order, the whole food supply system is paying very close attention to this and farmers are talking about it and agronomists are talking about it and we can rapidly, you know, engage some major action. So 10,000 meters is like the production, like the minimum. If you're gonna be doing something on scale, like that's what it is apparently is 10,000. So. Um, three and a half million dollars involves the engineering, the design, the software updates, calibrations, so you got more than 10 crops and manufacturing 10,000 meters. And it's 12 months. So like we're at that point now where, you know, over minor this, except for this minor hump of three and a half million dollars in donations, um, <laughs> which, you know, conceivably is not a lot of money. Yeah. Um, then we can, we can have this thing kick into the next level of gear. Um, so to the point of what's the broad strategy, I want this in smartphones. I don't want us to make it. I want Apple to make it. I want Samsung to make it. I want Google to make it. I want them to compete to have the best meters in, this, in their smartphones. And I want them to calibrate that meter to our data set. To and what? our data set, to the open data set, to the collaborative, collective, open data set. And not so, not purchase data set from <clears throat> Calorganics. So if, you know, yeah. if Amazon um, in their Kindle um, puts a meter and they understand that, well, that, that Whole Foods' quality is poor and so they cheat and they have a different app, a different algorithm, mm -hmm. then we all collectively say Kindle's, you know, meter is wrong. I mean, there has to be some accountability, there has to be a social movement, there has to be consciousness around it. But if we get some groups that are honorable and some groups that are not, um, it's about first mover advantage, right? If we get this meter out there and everybody gets the word bionutrient in their mind, and then we say bionutrient says what Apple's doing is honorable and what Google's doing is honorable and what Samsung's doing is not honorable, that's the word. That's the word on the street. So we don't control it per se, but we're first movers and we're in a place to, to be telling the story. And there's enough people that have sick children they're going to tell their friends that we think with bottom-up empowerment we can maintain some integrity of the system. So, um, now, I think I laid it out. Yes. The concept would be the store that says we've already done this with all our products. Yep. You come here, you know it's the best. And if it's verified by people on the ground, and that that's the truth, then guess who people are going to go shopping at? And this whole point is, if you have this trusted open data set at the center, then we want people to make money because that's what most people are inspired by. We want people to make more money doing the right thing. So we're gonna set up a structure to empower that, to facilitate that. Um, 
But the biggest problem is it's based on charitable donations at the center because there's no ROI, there's no return on investment. If you want to invest a million dollars because you know somebody who's got money, there's, it's not an option, right? There's nothing, there's no ownership, control, stocks, shares, profits, options because we don't own it. Do you have any problem with advertising? So say somebody said, yeah, I'll give you three and a half million, but you know, I'll give you a million Absolutely, totally wonderful. I will, you know, shout their name to the mountaintops. As long as they don't want to control it. Right. It's, control is not an option, but you'll be in the history books. Yeah, you want to actually have a, you want to have a, a legacy? I mean, I would suggest this could be a legacy that many people will be proud of. Um, and at some point you got enough money and you're gonna die. So maybe you want to think about it that way. Um, I haven't found that person yet. So anybody you know, like, um, please send them our way. I just yeah. want to say, I just I just did a leadership um, week with, with an organization I'm involved with, and we did a, but there was, you know, workshops on fundraising, and uh, a really in, interesting fact that I learned was that individuals actually, if you look at foundations and where they get their money, um, the largest percentage of money comes from individual donors, mm -hmm. not from foundations, not from corporations. Yep. So, you know, it, it's possible, um, quite possible, to to raise that amount of money. It's from, entirely possible from individual individual donors. Yeah. That's that's the people who. So donate. watch our website, and <laughs> you know, because this is what we're actively engaged in. I want to by the end of the year have raised this money and not just to, for the meter, but for the other stuff we're doing with nutrient density and beef and other crops. And, you know, maybe I'll take a salary and you get possibly some staff that could pay too. So, you know, but yeah, I mean, I think what we're doing is exciting. And, um, but of course I do, because I'm doing it. Um, do you attend, um, so like Albert's work? What's that? So where Albert's work extended onto the Albert Center, Albert Center for Nutrition Science, is that where you guys do your research and you Categorical. I mean, reversing chronic illness, for starters, my objective is consciousness, which I haven't talked about yet. I'm saving that for the end, but yeah, the objective is raising consciousness. And it's really hard to have high levels of consciousness if you have high levels of dysfunction, disease, incoherence, low energy, you know, foggy mind, stress. Like you can't be a high functioning individual if you've got these baseline dysfunctions. So like we can't, we can't really move forward culturally, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, until we're relatively coherent. Um, so, anyway, I probably have arrived at 3.30. So yes. the, the same way you measured is that how the sun controls and tells a carrot to be a carrot is to those light spectrum. How the sun tells a carrot to be a carrot? Yeah, the, the, it hits the, it, it can, it activates the carrotness of the carrot through the light spectrum <laughs> in reverse. Oh, the same way how you're measuring it. I, I think, uh, I'm not sure I would agree with that statement. Okay. Um, I mean, definitely communication happens through light. Yeah. I think the carrot has its own correct, correct, vibration correct. that it engages with the light from the yeah. sun and magic happens there, but yeah. Um, how, many, how many elements can you analyze with that? With many... So right now we're not directly analyzing anything. We're back calibrating from lab work. So what happens is when the soil or the, or the carrot goes into the lab, we flash the light at it first and then run it through the lab. So we've got, this, we've got the spectral signature and then we've got the number and then we apply AI and big data algorithms basically. And we say this spectral signature means this and this spectral signature means that. So yeah, this is rudimentary. This is just 10 LEDs. This is not a fancy instrument. I call this an Apple II, as in, <laughs> you, know, you know what an Apple II was? Yeah. Back in the olden days, like way before computers were in people's houses, they were in the basement of universities. And then there was a computer, which was a sort of a computer, which you could have, which you could maybe play Frogger on if you were a coder, right? <laughs> That's what we got. We got the, it's, you can play Frogger if you're a coder. But that communicates with a cell phone? So like you would yes, this, point it at the light and, or at the carrot and then say, I'm looking at a carrot. Yeah, so you have to, this part of the issue with the uh -huh. software, this all runs through a, a, smart, okay. a smartphone and the, you, when it's Bluetooth, so, you know, 
the, the button is on the phone, not on the meter. Oh. So you all, everything is directed here and the reading comes out here. Um, yeah. So, but right now only Android, not app, not, I, not iOS. Um, so, you know, we're, and right now you have to press the button a number of times before you get the reading. So it's, it's janky, it's slow, it's, it's not slick. This is not where we want to be. This is like, it's, it's a personal spectrometer, not a university spectrometer. That's, that's the step. How many have we built? Um, I think about 500. Um, and there's another hundred coming in. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, supply chain issues in the last couple of years have been a serious pain in the butt. Um, and um, yeah, we've never, we've never really marketed it. Um, and whenever we have them on the, on the website, they sell out and then we have to take them off again. Um, so my thought is we should be able to sell 10,000 of these next year um, if we can get them built. Um, but right now getting the money to, raise, to build them is the issue. So. 3.30 has come and gone, I'm fairly certain. Can we have the time? 3.38. Okay, can we uh, take a quick stretch and pee and come back at 3.50?